Hey everyone, I'm Alex Littlehales. I'm one of the reporters here at 13 News Now, and I'm one of two people that had a heavy hand in telling the story of how coastal flooding is impacting the Guinea community of Gloucester County alongside our digital producer, Savannah Hogdahl. Now, I got the idea for this story because Savannah is a Gloucester County native and pitched this to me because I've been trying to do something, a series of environmental stories called Turning the Tide, which is sort of a look at both environmental problems, but also solutions locally here in the Tidewater region. And basically this story gets into the idea of how coastal flooding impacts rural communities versus urban communities. You know, when we talk about coastal flooding, we often cover big urban cities like Norfolk, Virginia Beach, but this is a different perspective. How do those uh, environmental challenges impact a different demographic and a different population? And what I found when I was covering the stories, because I'm not from there, what I found is that the people of the Guinea community in Gloucester County are so proud to call this community their home. We're all proud of where we come from, right? But it's amazing to see how this community takes some of these environmental challenges and tackles them head on. So what's maybe not normal for us in terms of dealing with coastal flooding is normal to them. And I think that that's a remarkable part about this story and how people are adapting to a changing environment around them. It was an honor to work on this story and tell the stories of these people in this community and enjoy. It's a wonderful day walking with Jesus. Every step of the way, he's got a blessing waiting for you today. It's a beautiful morning. It's a wonderful day. <laughs> I've always worked on the water all my life, though. And uh, I love fishing. I've crabbed, oysted, you name it on the water, I've done it. You know, I'm going out on the water in the morning, though. She was, uh, well, how old were you, boot lab? I can see her now. She come out the store. She walked in front of the car. She got like you shit. She said, boy, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and seven years later, we were married. <laughs> Kenny Man Kellum is 83 years young. The part of Gloucester called Guinea isn't just his home. It's the place where he built a life worth living. Darth and myself, if we lived to see it, Christmas Eve, we've been married 63 years. We lived, we've been down here 62 years in this house. My name is Walter Priest. I'm a uh, retired marine scientist and specialized in wetlands biology. Priest has proudly lived in Guinea since the 70s. They're a wonderful group of people that um, will do anything in the world for you. I've lived here and raised, raised a family and three sons and I couldn't think of a much better place. Everyone knows everybody and everybody's related to everybody. But loving Guinea comes with its burdens. The community's very resilient. Isabel was a big wake up call. Much of Guinea was flooded and a lot of houses were raised. Since we've been down here, we know they had, had the tide to come in the house but one time, and that was Isabel, you know. And we've been here through all other hurricanes and stuff, but since Isabel, Isabel changed this place down here. It changed everywhere on this east coast. My house was 39 inches off the ground, and when Isabel hit here, I had 19 inches of water in the house, and it was 58 inches in the yard right here. And uh, when we came back home, Everything was gone. I think it's because it impacts kind of fewer people and it's less visible on a big scale. It hasn't had as much attention. Dr. Molly Mitchell is always looking for ways to protect people who call the coast home. I am a marsh ecologist is where I started my training, but I actually do a lot of work with um, sea level rise and flooding and how it impacts the communities along the Virginia coastline. In the urban areas, you have a lot of people living close together, so there's a potential for a lot of impact from any amount of flooding. But you also have um, a lot of public infrastructure, right? If a drinking water plant were to say, start to become salinized, right? That's a public piece of infrastructure. 
And so there is a public entity that's responsible for it, and so you know they do upgrades, and maybe they have to raise rates a little bit or something. But the burden's kind of shared across everybody. If an individual's well becomes brackish, then they pay to dig a new well. So they bear all the burden of the adaptation. Guinea's unique geography sets the table for some of the trouble. There's a geologic structure called the Suffolk Scarp, which is a, a terrace in the landscape. One side of the Suffolk Scarp, which is where 17 goes up, is actually a much higher elevation. And then there's a flatter, lower area that spreads out in front of it. And the Suffolk Scarp does run down through the Hampton Roads area. But anything on the water side of the Suffolk Scarp is going to be flat and it's gonna be relatively close to the water elevation. So it's right facing the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So it's in a position where you get a lot of uh, wind waves coming up during storm events, that kind of thing, um, from the ocean. And it's you know open to the water, and then it's got this wide expanse of marshes, which is actually kind of unusual in Virginia. A lot of times we have narrower marshes in front of properties. It's very, very flat because of all those marshes though. So that means a relatively small increase in water floods a wide area. Mm. If you're on a shoreline with a steeper slope, mm. maybe you just need to move back a little bit and the water won't affect you, right? Mm. But when you have this really flat expanse, no matter how far you move back, you might still be in an area that's going to be impacted. It's not an everyday problem, but Mitchell says flooding is something people are seeing more and more. Periodically during uh, storm events that floods roads and people, they time their travel around the tides. You know, in, in some areas you have to do that and doesn't have much of an effect on everyday life. The wetlands move inland as the sea level rise and it, you can see the, the ghost forest where there are dead trees standing up out in the marsh. Well, that's an artifact of sea level rise. Where I keep my boat, the guy built a, a fish stand, you know, a fish cleaning stand, ply, plywood and four posts, and he used to mow the grass around that fish cleaning table. That fish team table is 30 feet out in the marsh now, and, and that's happened in 40 years. Changing tides change more than just the shoreline here. There are places in Guinea that used to be farmland that are now just reeds and rushes. Well, as sea level rises, the wetland area tends to move landward in places where it can. There are other areas in low-lying areas that in previous you know, sea levels that have been farmed or some of those areas are starting to get inundated to the point where they can no longer grow crops on them. And what is a combination of the, the actual flooding and then the salt residue that is left in the soil from the seawater makes it inhospitable. And that's, there are places where that's evident. There are a lot of places you can walk back in the, in the woods here and see old corn rows. You can still see the rows in the woods. Not even trees are immune. The classic example that I can give you is I, I hunt on an island complex offshore in the York River. When I first started hunting out there, the island was much larger. There was actually a large stand of pine trees out there. What they were is they were old dune ridges from years ago. They have formed into marsh and is now, as sea level has risen, the island is starting to break up. Once the water level gets higher, the, the, the vegetation can't survive, so it dies off, and then that makes the edge of the vegetation more susceptible to erosion. Erosion may be a problem that current Guinea residents are taking in stride, but it's a challenge for archaeologists who want to know more about the Guinea that was thriving well before the American Revolution. The lost represents kind of a nice microcosm of all these different elements of Virginia history in one in one place. Thane Harpole grew to love history as a student in Gloucester in the 80s. Now he's a co-director of the Fairfield Foundation, which works to preserve the county's ruins and artifacts. It's a pretty early history from the colonial side, obviously starting in the mid-17th century, of kind of building this plantation landscape is, is a big one that Gloucester had played a big role in in the colonial period and you know we can explore today. Um, but of course there's also a lot of Native history here, you know, it was Powhatan's capital. There's the, the Native American component, which was a, a you know, fairly substantial, you know, small village. Um, so one, you know, one question would be how, you know, popular was the Guinea area during the, you know, a thousand, two thousand years ago. And this, this village actually demonstrated that, yeah, you definitely had people living here. They were clearly taking advantage of resources that were close by, so you have the waters there, so you got fish oysters, clams, all those sorts of things. So that's not unusual, but it, did, it does prove that, that they were here. And then there's the mid-17th century component, which 
we think is, we don't know who, who was living there, but it's a, it's a property that was patented in the 1640s, and we think people start, you know, settled that land in the 1640s, so it's a very early European settlement in what is now Gloucester County, um, probably one of the first. One of the un unusual things about that plantation is it does seem, to, instead of having like one dominant house, um, it seems to have been split up amongst relatives, and so there are lots of smaller houses on this property, and I'm not sure why that happened, you know, for whatever reason, um, but that seems to me to be the origin of this kind of tight-knit community of Guinea that's sort of not really cut off from everywhere else, but it's kind of on the edge. They're not so isolated today, but people born there are still fiercely loyal to Guinea. We left here and went to uh, Canada. We were gone 10 days and uh, come on back down through Tennessee and all them places and came home. When I got home and I went down on Brands Bay Dock down on the Mike Jack Bay, the prettiest place I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Even if it's changing under their feet. Sea level has been rising as long as we've been measuring it in Virginia. So we've been measuring it back to 1928 down in Sewell's Point region. Um, and it's been rising that entire time. It's been rising faster, though, in the recent history than it was at the beginning of that time period. And now we're at a point where anyone who's lived on their property since 1970 has actually seen the water come up eight inches. Um, so that's a pretty big change. It's hard to see at the water's edge um, because the tide goes in and out every day, right? So you don't necessarily notice if the tide comes in a little further one year than it did a previous year. And also because the shorelines, the edges are eroding, the front edges are eroding, and so that makes it difficult to see. Where people see it in the rural areas with these big marshes, you know, they built their house and it was grass, it was upland, and then there was a marsh in front of it, and then there was the water. And as the sea level rises, that marsh has been moving backwards. So now people have the marsh underneath their house, where that wasn't the case when they bought the property. And the road, you know, it used to be they could get in and out of their neighborhood, except maybe during Hurricane Isabel. But now their road under these really high height tides is underwater for a few hours at high tide. In fact, if you look at um, the tide gauge records and you project those over the landscape, what you can see is that the hours of flooding have increased dramatically. So what that means is not that flood events are necessarily longer, but that you're just getting a lot more of them. Hurricane Isabel's mark was deep for most people in Guinea, but the cleanup process gave Kellum more than waterproof walls. He got a completely fresh start. I work down here every day. I get down here at daybreak in the morning and stay here till the sun went behind the trees. And then I'd go up to my son to spend the night. The next morning, the same thing. You know, I was up at my son's house and uh, the phone rang. He says, Daddy, he says, the preacher from Union Church wants to talk to you. JD says, uh, Candy Man, what you planning on doing tomorrow? I said, well, J.D., if that don't happen, I'm going to put some uh, sheetrock up. He said, well, I got some people here from Kansas who want to help you. The next morning, it was 12 people from Kansas came here and helped me. And when we left early here that afternoon, we had four sheets of sheetrock left. I told Dorothy, I says, I can tell you one thing. The devil didn't send these people. I says, the good Lord sent them. And I can tell you, they were a great help. Yes, indeed. I, so that's when we we started going to church, and uh, I think we went to church about three months, and then we joined the church, you know, baptized and everything. Now Kellum says his home stands ready for anything. I can tell you, it's a right good ways up here now. Eight foot four inches in the air. If the tide comes in my house, you better have flood insurance. There are still some things insurance can't help with. As, as college students, we came out here um, with a, an upperclassman who was doing work. Our main interest was in the Middle Woodland Native Village and a mid 17th century historic site that, that was eroding together because they were on the same place. But they were also right next to a 19th century cemetery. And at the time, in the 90s, the cemetery was still, you know, 20, 30 feet from the shore. And after college, we, start, we kept coming back to the site um, and you know, documenting more things that were eroding and you know, noting that, oh, yep, these burials are getting closer and closer. And I think by the late 90s or early 2000s, burials were starting to, to, to wash out. And on a regular site, you can map things, you can tie them into a building, and it doesn't change. But on a site where the beach is moving, you have to tie them into different points. And so we actually had a process of mapping the shoreline 
every time we went out there. And so over the course of like 10 years, we mapped 100 feet of shoreline erosion. And this is right on the York River, so it's, you know, it's open to all the storms. Um, there's no marsh anymore, and so you, know, you only have two feet of shoreline. So it's easy for tides and storms just to take that away. Um, and that, you know, that two feet contains a lot of the record of the last thousand years of, of people's history on the site. From our perspective, in, in a situation like that, really all you can do is try to recover and, and learn what you can before you know, the, the water washes the rest away. Um, you know, the other question you start thinking about is, well, can you, do, can you prevent some of this? Is, are there things you can do to stop, to, to stop that? And those are all much longer uh, and more expensive solutions, you know, so you, can you, you know, rebuild marsh or rebuild oyster reefs or put in riprap or all these other things? Sure. Um, but people aren't usually going to do that just for archaeology. You have to have other, you know, compelling reasons to, to protect um, the shorelines. Many people who live in Guinea have gone through the pricey process of raising their houses. It can cost $100,000 or more. Gloucester County has worked with FEMA to lift 50 homes with grant funding in the last 20 years and is in the process of raising 15 more right now. It's hard to be perfectly floodproofed, though. You know, your electricity might run through pipes that are in the ground. Your water supply, your well, is vulnerable to flooding. So it's not just we focus a lot on the houses and we talk a lot about the houses, but in terms of building resilience, there, that alone is not going to make the area resilient. And so the challenge is really to find, I think, different ways to live within the landscape so that you're not you're not just trying to keep everything exactly the way it is, but somehow f flood proof it or, you know, yeah. deal with floods, yeah. Most of the people who live on the water, certainly the ones who live there a long time, love the water. Like, they, they really love the water and they really have a tight connection to it. So to a certain extent, I, I mean, they're probably more tolerant of flooding than you might find. Um, for someone who moves there, who's new and moves there, right, and is like, oh, I can't get out of my neighborhood on high tides or something, and people who've lived there a long time are like, yeah, you know. <laughs> Resilience has been a way of life in Guinea for a long time. We, we found several things like wells and pits and things, and a lot of them were just completely filled with oyster shells. And then we think there's some evidence on the site that uh, poten potentially it was damaged by a hurricane, um, and that caused them to, uh, we think, maybe put an addition to their house or make major repairs, um, but also uh, abandon a well and probably dig a new one. Um, these were wells that were, you know, you dig a hole and you take a, a hogshead barrel, so a wooden barrel, and you sink those down in there. Those barrels were expensive and, and valuable, and so if when the well, you know, went dry or got salty or something, you, you go in there and you try to get the, salvage the barrel out of that so you could reuse it. Um, so we dug one of the, one of the wells and at the very bottom, we had a half of a wooden ladder, and there was no evidence of the barrel. So they had, they had put a ladder in there, and they had salvaged the barrel, and then the ladder broke. That evidence of, of a possible storm fits with, I think, the, um, there was a big hurricane in 1666 that could be the storm that, that may have flooded the site, but it shows that you know, this idea of flooding in Guinea and storms, you know, it's not new. They, it's been a problem for a long time. Some things don't change. <laughs> Longtime residents are still, hundreds of years later, making changes to adjust their lives to the environment so they can stay in this Riverside community. You hear people say the water's awful dangerous. Oh yes, it's dangerous, but it can be friendly to you too. <laughs>